Let's start off by way of getting to know you. Uh, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? How did you get involved with cryptocurrency in general? All right, so great question. So by day I work in at IBM. I'm in enterprise sales at IBM. And I had a buddy of mine from college basically bugged me for about a month trying to get me to introduce him to the director of blockchain at IBM. And I was like, why do you care so much about this blockchain stuff, right? So he's like, I, I began this Bitcoin crypto hedge fund and I'm doing this different types of blockchain projects and I met him at a conference and I've been trying to hunt him down ever since then. So I'm like, all right, cool, you know, because me being a, me being on the inside of IBM, I basically have all, all the, these people, people's contact information. So I'm like, all right, cool, here's, here's his contact, have at it. But I was like, hey, just answer me, this, answer, me, answer me this question though. How much money are you making from this crypto stuff? Because you're basically my age, what are you doing starting a cryptocurrency hedge fund? Mm -hmm. So he told me he was making, he made 200% in the last year or so from investing in Bitcoin and cryptos, like uh, Ethereum. And I was just blown away, right? Because in traditional investing, getting a 20% is mind boggling, right? 20% is good. So for somebody to get triple digit returns, and this guy was, wasn't a hedge fund professional, he was just a regular dude, right? To a point I'm like, you know what, this is interesting. So last year, I began testing the waters in cryptos. I bought some Bitcoin, bought some Ethereum, just kind of test the water out. And I had 25% return in the first month. So I'm like, okay, this, this stuff is pretty legit. The next month, it was like 30%. Then uh, I, I caught Ethereum from $10 to $40. That's when I became a believer in cryptos. That was my coming to Jesus moment. I'm like, you know what, this is life changing. Right, so ever since then, I began dumping money into cryptos, and now it's kind of become my almost my full time side hustle, and soon, eventually, probably will, will become my my full time job. Just doing this full time. That's that's really exciting, Ian. Uh, you know, in 2011, Bitcoin was monopoly money, right? And 2013, it was just extreme speculation. 2014, 2015, everyone forgot about it. But 2017, cryptocurrency solidified itself as the future. And you're talking about hedge funds and, and, and institutional money. And I, I was, I've been saying that 2018 will be the year that cryptocurrency uh, becomes an asset class. And um, maybe that's already happening, where the big money really, en really starts to enter it. Uh, and we see it go into the trillion dollar mo total market cap. Uh, and I, I know it's going that direction. Uh, but so let's, we're doing this interview and here we are with Bitcoin at nearly an all time high. It's a, essentially all time high. I'm saying that a lot nowadays. Oh, it did, yeah. <laughs> so. It's the all time high. It's at like 3,400, 3,500. It's crazy. Yeah, so. so, okay, so let's just kind of get your thoughts in, in general terms with Bitcoin before we get into some of these other ICOs. Where are we headed with Bitcoin in your opinion? Because a lot of people say that, hey, it's not really finite. We know that there's only 21 million, but we just had a hard fork, right? And technically right, right. we can keep splitting it up and then there's all the other ones. And if you reduce it down to what it essentially is, there's really nothing backing it. You can't wear it around your neck like you would a, a, a jewelry piece or a piece of gold or a piece of silver, right? Or industrial use. So just let's get your initial thoughts uh, and the trajectory of Bitcoin and your confidence in it long term. All right, so long term, I'm still, I'm very, very bullish on Bitcoin. I don't think it's going away anytime soon. I think Bitcoin is here to last, whether people like that or not. Now, with that being said, though, I don't think it will be the biggest currency down the line. But I think Bitcoin has already won a use case of basically currency and money, right? Digital currency. But there are other different use cases out there for other things on blockchains, right? For example, Ethereum has the ICO use case. Ethereum has the use cases for decentralized applications. Right, so Bitcoin it will become just one of many different currencies, and actually, I think Bitcoin in the next year or so will will be displaced by Ethereum, because if you actually look at the daily trading volume, not not just the market cap, but the daily trading volume, for the last, I'd say three or four months, Ethereum has been number one, going back and forth between Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? So Ethereum is basically on a steady climb up, and I think it's eventually going to surpass Bitcoin. But now, I'm just kind of keep things on Bitcoin. Bitcoin has value, 
right? Bitcoin, I mean, because things like fiat, fiat has no value, really. Fiat has value in the sense that the government says it will back it, and they'll give you, they'll, they'll insure your money to a particular amount, right? But Bitcoin has value because, especially in places like the developing world, where people have uncertainty around their money, mm. right? Where there's dictatorships, government, for example, India recently, I believe, devalued their currency. Their bank just said, okay, all this currency we have is pretty much worthless because we're changing, we're changing the rules. And people were out of luck because they had no control of their money. Bitcoin is, is changing things by, and disrupting things by giving people control of their money. The money is theirs, hmm. right? So, for example, in uh, I think t- between 2018 and 2013, different countries like Cyprus had all this, had went through this uh, disaster in the, with the economy to a point that the banks were seizing people's assets, right? The government would go to people's bank accounts and take their money and basically try to read basically try to share that money across the entire country mm. of, the, of, the, of the populace, even though it was their herd earned money, right? So Bitcoin, in a way, is a hedge against things like that. It's a way to protect yourself from banks seizing your assets, from privacy, from even just freedom, right? Mm. Because, for example, girls in Pakistan, right? Let's say there's a girl in Pakistan, she, they can't have bank accounts because they're female, and, but they can earn Bitcoin online. Right, so there's so many different use cases that I don't think this is going away anytime soon. Mm. Long term, Bitcoin is here to stay. It may not completely dominate the entire landscape. What I picture is having other altcoins, which, are, which stands for alternative coins, basically fulfill multiple use cases. So it won't be just Bitcoin. Yeah, and for everyone who who assumes that it's just going to be you know one or the other, look at look at companies in general, right? Look at these tech companies. Uh, there was a huge tech boom in the early two thousands, but a, a lot of them went away. But there were a few that rose to the top, and it's not necessarily that Bitcoin needs to be at the top or number two, but. Uh, even if it is number five, let's just say that uh, it can still grow over time uh, and be the Amazon or the Coca-Cola of the the cryptocurrency money of right, use right. case. Right. So uh, that's something that I, I think Bitcoin is continuing to show itself to be resilient, especially through all this scaling debate. It continues to thrive, which I think is saying a lot. OK, so let's get into some of these uh, altcoins, these this ICOs and specifically when it re- in regards to um, companies trying to raise money. ICO sounds like an IPO, except the difference is in an IPO, you actually get equity. In an ICO, you are just getting a token and you're not necessarily getting a token that's tied to the revenues of a company. And just it's the wild west out there right now. And uh, you know, a lot of money is being made, but at the same time, there's a lot of uncertainty. And so uh, let's just start off with your general thoughts on that. I think I'll basically just say this, what a time to be alive, right? <laughs> right now, as I mentioned in the videos, right, we're in the greatest transfer of wealth in human history, right? So this is actually a quote from, I believe, Tai Zen on uh, YouTube. But never have we seen a time where anybody, the average person, has access to to changing their lives so, so drastically from relatively little investments over a short period of time. Right? And I think ICOs are really the, the best asset class, if, if you, you're trying to call it that, to invest in cryptos, right? And to have your entire life just change almost over one year, two years, or even three years. Right, so ICOs basically let people or let companies raise money in exchange for tokens. Right, so one of the biggest ICOs was uh, Ethereum. So people gave Ethereum money before they even had anything. It was just a pure white paper. They gave them money in exchange for these tokens, and the tokens are, it's almost kind of like speculating because people expect the value of that token to increase in time as that project becomes more successful. Even though that token may not necessarily be tied to that project, they expect that if this project is successful, this token will have more value. Now with the entire SEC memo that came out and all these regulations, projects now are definitely trying to make certain that their tokens have utility and they actually 
be, being actually used on, on their project. Mm. So for example, with, with Ethereum, it's able to do that in the sense that you have to pay Ether as gas for the transaction cost on their, on their network. Right, so for every application on there that's running on on top of their network, it has to pay Ether. So all these different products are basically doing the same thing. They're creating utility with their tokens, some not so much. And some people say it's a wild, wild west. I say that's a good thing because lots of volatility is good because that's where money is made. Hmm. So for me as an investor, you know, I I I'm in, I'm in crypto because it's volatile, because that's where you have the drastic swings. Like for example, today I, I'm actually in a swing trade that's up 80% in basically one day, right? So you don't only really get that in the regular traditional capital markets, right? Like imagine buying Walmart and getting an 80 percent return, hmm. right? So it's unheard of. <laughs> yeah. So cryptos is really the best way to do that, and I think ICOs if, are the best way to get there initially, right? Because you're basically buying a token at its possible cheapest price. Hmm. All right, Ian. So we're still very early in this and these companies that are issuing these ICOs, uh, as far as the market is concerned, it's still too early to say that we've nailed down the ideal source code that should be used going forward, right? There's just so many different ICOs out there, so many different tokens, and not, not many people like that. Many of them are pre-mined or very centralized. And do you see this getting nailed down over time as we, we progress that, hey, you know, we are going to really nail down and the market's going to say, this is the, this is the type of token we will go forward using in future ICOs. In terms of the, the actual token? Yeah, well, in terms of the the source code, the, the type of token, the some sort of technology that people can trust in, because right now each one is so different, because you can say that I trust the project or I trust the, the business, but you don't know necessarily about the, the token that they're gonna use, the, the code behind it. And a lot of people trust Bitcoin because it's been around for a long time. Right, right, so in terms of the projects or the, or the networks, we're still in the infancy stage. Now there are some clear winners, right? For the most part, the top two, Bitcoin and Ethereum, are the primary products where products are being forked off of. But right now, I think in terms of other tokens, I think the clear standard or the clear, yeah, I would say the clear standard right now is Ethereum in the sense that most ICOs, I'm not sure what the actual percentage is, but my guess would be so over 70% of the ICOs right now are working or running their ICO or their tokens on the Ethereum blockchain. Right. So actually, Ethereum has, has made a standard called the ERC-20 token, which is basically a common standard that any Ethereum project or, yeah, I would say project or DAP, right, or, or application can use. Right. So all these different ICOs, for example, Civic and EOS and all these different ICOs, when they create tokens, they're actually creating tokens that are compatible based on the ERC-20 standard, meaning that it's easier for other exchanges to trade its tokens because they all have an, an agreed upon number of different rules that they all follow. Mm -hmm. right? So in terms of the actual code, the code is pretty straightforward. It's basically the same if, if they all abide by this common standard called ERC-20 token. So that's the first start standard that's really getting some, I would say, mainstream adoption in the, token, in, in the ICO marketplace. Now, outside of that, most products, though, they're still in the infancy. They haven't really competed or come close to Ethereum when it comes to creating tokens. Well, that, that is a, a good point that you bring up. The market is providing a way for people to be able to semi-trust some of these new uh, tokens out there, which is a, a good point. So, um, okay, so lots of different uses for blockchain. Right now, we're so used to it, having it associated to some sort of um, speculative component right we we buy a token and it goes up and down and and that's what you do that's what you love you love making money on the blockchain but let's right. talk about some of the other uses for blockchain do you see this as an opportunity for a lot of technology to go in many different directions yeah i mean so blockchain is being integrated into almost every field of technology from healthcare to food to law, 
I was actually at an event where they're working with law and blockchain, right? So blockchain is becoming, I think it's one of the best innovations since the internet itself, right? As most, most people say in this space. This is why people are so bullish on this space because it's truly a disruptive technology. Being able to have two parties interact without having a central authority or middle person, right? So being able to interact peer-to-peer in a purely decentralized and trustless manner, right? So I think having that, that can be applied in any field. Any field can be can be disrupted. So for example, I have a buddy of mine, he works in crowdfunding, and even their field is getting dis- disrupted. Mm-hmm. And their field is pretty brand new, right? Because their field, crowdfunding, like the Kickstarter and stuff, right? That, was, that came about after the Jobs Act, and that was relatively pretty recently. But even that is being disrupted by blockchain. So if things like that that are brand new are being disrupted, then definitely all the old industries are being disrupted from shipping to mining to retail. Right? So every, there's no industry that's immune to having this technology improve that, improve that industry. Yeah, I, I agree with you uh, wholeheartedly on that. So is, is there a way to use blockchain and separate it from the token, the monetary component, or do you need that to give the miners incentive and for it to be decentralized? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> so yes, in a sense, yeah, there are definitely blockchain products that aren't don't do ICOs, don't have pre-mining, especially, for example, with me, right? I work at IBM. When I, I work with Fortune 500 companies, they don't care about tokens or ICOs. Right? They just want to have their blockchain and have this for the customers or whatever product they're trying to build. So these are more what what are called private blockchains, right? So those are definitely available from the Hyperledger to even Ethereum and, and so forth with the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance. So yes, it's possible to have a blockchain without having a token. But I would say the tokens are more for those publicly facing blockchain projects that aren't really being done by a company. Maybe they're being done by a startup or whatever, or a foundation. And they're trying to incentivize people to to basically help the network grow fa- fast at a at a yeah basically faster at a larger scale, and also have a greater community. Yeah, because game theory economics play a factor in terms of getting people to actually do what you want them to do on the blockchain. Because otherwise, people can just turn off the blockchain and nobody's transactions will go through. Right. So, for example, with miners, they get paid. Right, they basically have that incentive to to host their nodes because they're earning money. Right, so all these different incentives, I believe, I think most projects should have them, especially if you're doing a public project. But if you're doing a private facing project, then no, you can you can have a blockchain without tokens. So, Ian, what is a what is that's interesting. I've never heard of a, a private blockchain before. So, what does a private blockchain look like? And how does it work? How is the it incentivized to be trusted? If if you know what I mean, because that's the whole point of why we like the blockchain is that you know it's decentralized, it can be trusted. Uh, how do you make it private, and then how do you make it secure? I mean, so private in the sense that it's internal to a company, right? So, for example, let's say a customer like uh, Tiffany's has different diamonds they want to keep or store on a blockchain and log for, for their internal records, right? Or maybe they want to work with their business partners, right? So it's more like kind of like a trusted network of people on a blockchain, right? So it's not publicly available to somebody to go on GitHub or to go on, on some search engine and find that blockchain is internal to the company, kind of like an intranet, mm-hmm. right? So you have the internet and you have the internet in, inside a company. So you can have private blockchains inside a company. Or inside a trusted network. Okay, so and then I guess it, it would just be for the purpose of the company, so the company would support the network, then, right? And and then right. that, there yes, would yeah. be. Um, I get. I, I'm just wondering how that would go about being secured and to a, a trustworthy uh, degree that we let's say trust bitcoin and uh so i guess the company would fund it then too right they would be paying for the network right out of their own revenues is that fair to say or or it wouldn't necessarily come out of the blockchain as this like self-fulfilling thing like we have with bitcoin right i mean so this is kind of where it gets too technical but but in the sense that they don't really have to fund it per se right you can have a 
blockchain, you just have to have, for example, let's say it's a node, it's a proof of staking or, or proof of mining blockchain, right? regardless of, of what it is, right? The company just has to have different nodes being able to facilitate the network hmm. of, and, and to facilitate transactions on the blockchain. Right? So these nodes could be internal to the company. Maybe it's just a company and their cu- customers. Maybe it's just a company and their business partners. Right? So in the sense that that's what I mean by private. So for example, there's Ripple. Right? Ripple is known as a private blockchain. Ripple works with the banks. That's why some people give it flack. All the crypto anarchists give it flack for that. But they're, they they don't really care because they have their own trusted network, which are other banking, other banks across the world. Right? Mm-hmm. So those other banks work with each other on this blockchain and basically have their nodes, I believe. And they go through and talk with each other and send money worldwide at a much faster scale than even sending money with a, with a regular bank transfer or getting on a plane and sending money. Right, because having their own blockchain makes them have the same capabilities of a blockchain without really having that public access. Mm. Right, so it's the, the so their code is basically internal to them and their network. Well, I, I mean, it's all interesting stuff, and I, I know a lot of people are are really saying that hey, this is going to be the future. I I am one of them, and I think it's. Um, I think it's really fascinating where this is all going to go. And I think we're just barely scratching the surface as to where uh, it will go because it's still so new. And, and I feel like there's going to be people out there that expose new areas that we enter, which nobody was conceiving. So uh, all really good stuff. So Ian uh, Bellina, Ian, I, I want to let you know that I, I'm very grateful that you came on the show. And uh, if people want to learn more about what you're doing and uh, what they what they can get if they they visit your work, uh, please let them know. Oh yeah, so I have a website, ianblina.com. That's i-a-n-b-a-l-i-n-a.com, where I just kind of share my journey. I'm basically documenting my process through investing in cryptos, through initial coin offerings, through trading, swing trades, sometimes day trading. And I just document the entire process. So I have a YouTube channel where I actually document my process to evaluating companies to invest in during the ICO stage, right? Because there's so many different companies. There's a, almost a ICO, there are probably like three or four ICOs every single day now, right? So how do you filter out all that noise? So on my YouTube channel, I basically show how I do that through my entire process. I share my spreadsheet that's kind of become famous now because I use that to predict different ICOs to invest in and I share everything publicly. I'm I'm trying to be transparent. I tweet my trades. I post my trades on Instagram and I share my portfolio every single day, the ups and the downs, the wins and the losses. And that's kind of how I've been able to grow an authentic. A lot of money is being made, but at the same time, there's a lot of uncertainty. And so uh, let's just start off with your general thoughts on that. I think I'll basically just say this, what a time to be alive, right? <laughs> right now, as I mentioned in the videos, right, we're in the greatest transfer of wealth in human history, right? So this is actually a quote from, I believe, Tai Zen on uh, YouTube. But never have we seen a time where anybody, the average person, has access to to changing their lives so, so drastically from relatively little investments over a short period of time. Right. And I think ICOs are really the the best asset class, if if you you're trying to call it that, to invest in cryptos, right? And to have your entire life just change almost over one year, two years, or even three years, right? So ICOs basically let people or let companies raise money in exchange for tokens, right? So one of the biggest ICOs was uh, Ethereum. So people gave Ethereum money before they even had anything. It was just a pure white paper. They gave them money in exchange for these tokens. And the tokens, are, it's almost kind of like speculating because people expect the value of that token to increase in time as that project becomes more successful. Even though that token may not necessarily be tied to that project, they expect that if this project is successful, this token will have more value. Now with the entire SEC memo that came out and all these regulations, projects now are definitely trying to make certain that their tokens have utility and they actually being actually used on, on their project. Mm. So for example, with, with Ethereum, it's able to do that in the sense that you have to pay Ether as gas for the transaction cost, 
on their on their network. Right. So for every application on there that's r running on on top of their network, it has to pay Ether. So all these different products are basically doing the same thing. They're creating utility with their tokens. Some not so much. And some people say so well. Let's start off by way of getting to know you. Uh, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? How did you get involved with cryptocurrency in general? All right. So great question. So by day I work in at IBM. I'm in enterprise sales at IBM. And I had a buddy of mine from college basically bug me for about a month trying to get me to introduce him to the director of blockchain at IBM. And I was like, why do you care so much about this blockchain stuff, right? So he's like, I, I began this Bitcoin crypto hedge fund and I'm doing this different types of blockchain projects and I met him at a conference and I've been trying to hunt him down ever since then. So I'm like, all right, cool, you know, because me being a me being on the inside of IBM, I basically have all, all of these people people's contact information. So I'm like, all right, cool. Here's here's his contact. Have at it. But I was like, hey, just answer me to, answer me answer me this question though. How much money are you making from this crypto stuff? Because you're basically my age. What are you doing starting a cryptocurrency hedge fund? Mm -hmm. So he told me he was making he made two hundred percent in the last year or so from investing in Bitcoin and cryptos like uh, Ethereum, and I was just blown away. Right, because in traditional investing, getting a twenty percent is mind-boggling. Right, twenty percent is good. So for somebody to get triple-digit returns, and this guy was wasn't a hedge fund professional; he was just a regular dude. Right, to a point, I'm like, you know what? This is interesting. So last year, I began testing the waters in cryptos. I bought some Bitcoin, bought some Ethereum, just kind of test the water out, and I had twenty-five percent return in the first month. So I'm like, okay, this this stuff is pretty legit. The next month. It was like 30%. Then uh, I, I cut Ethereum from $10 to $40. That's when I became a believer in cryptos. That was my coming to Jesus moment. I'm like, you know what? This is life changing. Right? So ever since then, I began dumping money into cryptos. And now it's kind of become my almost my full-time side hustle. And soon, eventually, probably we'll think Bitcoin has already won a use case of basically currency and money. Right, digital currency, but there are other different use cases out there for other things on blockchains. Right, for example, Ethereum has the ICO use case. Ethereum has the use cases for decentralized applications. Right, so Bitcoin is, will become just one of many different currencies. And actually, I think Bitcoin in the next year or so will will be displaced by Ethereum because if you actually look at the daily trading volume, not not just the market cap, but the daily trading volume for the last I would say three or four months, Ethereum has been number one going back and forth between Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? So Ethereum is basically on a steady climb up and I think it's eventually going to surpass Bitcoin. But now I'm just gonna keep things on Bitcoin. Bitcoin has value, right? Bitcoin, I mean, cause things like fiat, fiat has no value really. Fiat has value in the sense that the government says it will back it and they'll give you, they'll, they'll insure your money to a particular amount, right? But Bitcoin has value because, especially in places like the developing world, where people have uncertainty around their money, mm. right? Where there's dictatorships, government, for example, India recently, I believe, devalued their currency. Their bank just said, okay, all this currency we have is pretty much worthless because we're changing, we're changing the rules. And people were out of luck because they had no control of their money. Bitcoin is is changing things by, and disrupting things by giving people control of their money. The money is theirs, mm. right? So, for example, in uh, I think tw between 2018 and 2013, different countries like Cyprus had all this had went through this uh, disaster in the with the economy to a point that the banks were seizing people's assets. Right, the government would go to people's bank accounts and take their money and basically try to read basically try to share that money across the entire country mm. of, of, the, of the populace, even though it was their herd earned money. Right? So Bitcoin will become my, my full-time job, just doing this full-time. That's, that's really exciting, Ian. Uh, you know, in 2011, Bitcoin was monopoly money, right? And 2013, it was just extreme speculation. 2014, 2015, everyone forgot about it. But 2017... Cryptocurrency solidified itself as the future, and you're talking about hedge funds and, and, and institutional money. And I, I was, I've been saying that 2018 will be the year that cryptocurrency uh, becomes an asset class. 
and um, maybe that's already happening where the big money really and en- really starts to enter it uh, and we see it go into the trillion dollar mar- total market cap uh, and I-, I know it's going that direction uh, but so let's we're doing this interview and here we are with Bitcoin at nearly an all-time high it's a, essentially all-time high I'm saying that a lot nowadays oh it did yeah <laughs> so it's all-time high it's at like 3400 3500 it's crazy yeah, so. so okay, so let's just kind of get your thoughts in, ger- in general terms with Bitcoin before we get into some of these other ICOs. Where are we headed with Bitcoin, in your opinion? Because a lot of people say that hey, it's n- not really finite. We know that there's only 21 million, but we just had a hard fork, right? And technically, right, right. we can keep splitting it up. And then there's all the other ones. And if you reduce it down to what it essentially is, there's really nothing backing it. You can't wear it around your neck like you would a a, a jewelry piece or a piece of gold or a piece of silver, right? Or industrial use. So just let's get your initial thoughts uh, and the trajectory of Bitcoin and your confidence in it long term. All right, so long term, I'm still, I'm very, very bullish on Bitcoin. I don't think it's going away anytime soon. I think Bitcoin is here to last, whether people like that or not. Now, with that being said, though, I don't think it will be the biggest currency down the line. Right? Bitcoin, in a way, is a hedge against things like that. It's a way to protect yourself from banks seizing your assets, from privacy, from even just freedom. Mm-hmm. Right? Because, for example, girls in Pakistan, right? Let's say there's a girl in Pakistan, she. They can't have bank accounts because they're female, and but they can earn Bitcoin online. Right? So there's so many different use cases that I don't think this is going away anytime soon. Hmm. Long term, Bitcoin is here to stay. It may not completely dominate the entire landscape. What I picture is having other altcoins, which, are, which stands for alternative coins, basically fulfill multiple use cases. So it won't be just Bitcoin. Yeah, and for everyone who who assumes that it's just going to be you know one or the other, look at look at companies in general, right? Look at these tech companies. Uh, there was a huge tech boom in the early two thousands, but a, a lot of them went away. But there were a few that rose to the top, and it's not necessarily that Bitcoin needs to be at the top or number two, but. Uh, even if it is number five, let's just say that uh, it can still grow over time uh, and be the Amazon or the Coca-Cola of the the cryptocurrency money of right, use right. case. Right. So uh, that's something that I, I think Bitcoin is continuing to show itself to be resilient, especially through all this scaling debate. It continues to thrive, which I think is saying a lot. OK, so let's get into some of these uh, altcoins, these this ICOs and specifically when it re- in regards to um, companies trying to raise money. ICO sounds like an IPO, except the difference is in an IPO, you actually get equity. In an ICO, you are just getting a token and you're not necessarily getting a token that's tied to the revenues of a company and just it's the wild west out there right now and uh 